Hi everyone, welcome back. It's Artyom and today we will talk about self-supervised representation learning or how to learn useful representation from just a bunch of unlabeled images. I will give a high-level overview of what is self-supervised learning and explain the paper ClickCNN, which I co-authored with my colleagues at Heidelberg University. I will also explain the main idea in our follow-up work Deep Unsupervised Similarity Learning using partially ordered sets. And at the end we will briefly talk about a bunch of other important self-supervised learning methods. Let's start! Patterns and regular structures are surrounding us everywhere and they can take various forms. For example, regular geometrical shapes. We see dozens of similar houses every day, countless cars and people that have regular and reoccurring motions of body parts. Apparently, we don't need labels to discover these repetitive structures. And the aim of self-supervised learning is to find such patterns automatically and exploit them to organize, distill and generate knowledge. Let's get technical. We have a dataset of images and if we have ground truth class labels, then we can train a network to classify images using the provided labels. This is supervised training scenario. But what if we don't have labels and want to make sense of the data without any manual annotations? The trivial solution is to assign a unique surrogate label to every sample and train the model using supervised learning techniques. But in this case we will have only one positive for every class and many many negatives and we won't have enough information to model intra-class variants. Hmm, what can we do instead? We can exploit regularities in this dataset and try to automatically group each sample with its nearest neighbors. To group similar images automatically without labels, we need some image representation, different from raw RGB pixel values. We can start from cheap, off-the-shelf features like histogram of oriented gradients or HOG. Since they constitute a view-based approach, HOG features a viewpoint and rotation variant, which is especially beneficial for estimating pole similarity in 2D. Or we can even use features extracted by a randomly initialized network. Convolutional structure of neural networks already contains strong priors on the input signal and hence can extract somewhat meaningful features without training at all. For example, a multi-layer perceptron classifier on top of the last convolutional layer of random AlexNet achieves 12% accuracy on ImageNet, while the chance is at 0.1%. These ready-to-use features are of course very weak and not reliable, but they carry at least some signal which we can use to bootstrap our neural network. But how many neighbors should we and can we take? Let's look at the distribution of the similarities between a fixed image and all other images in the dataset. The similarity score here is measured as 1 minus distance and then rescaled to be in the range from 0 to 255. Most of these similarities in the middle part of the plot are evidently unreliable and thus the majority of samples cannot be ranked with respect to their similarity to a query. However, the most similar and the most dissimilar samples can be reliably identified as they are sticking out from the similarity distribution. We can thus utilize these samples to find a small set of nearest neighbors to the query and a set of samples that are very far. Let's start building groups of nearest neighbors. I visualize them with different colors – blue, yellow and green. Now we assign a unique surrogate label to every group and use supervised learning to train several one versus all classifiers. But such approach has serious flaws. First, there are as many surrogate classes as samples, because we retrieve neighbors for every sample. And second, transitivity does not hold among the neighbors which were assigned to the same surrogate class. Transitivity does not hold because our features are weak and not reliable. Both samples could be similar to the query but not necessarily between each other. However, we don't want to pull together things which are not similar. Before we jump into the solution of this problem, let's take a look at a real example. We have a sports dataset. We select a random query image and find its immediate nearest neighbors. The exemplars in this group may be close to the query but not to another due to lacking transitivity. As a result, to learn reliable intra-class similarities we need to restrict the model to group of samples which are compact and mutually similar to another. In graph theory terms, the samples should form a clique where all samples in the clique are worse to be assigned the same label. This way, we can decrease the number of non-reliable relationships used for training. After generating a set of compact clicks, we assign a unique surrogate label to each click. However, since only the highest and lowest similarities are reliable, samples in different clicks are not necessarily dissimilar. 
So to prevent separating potentially similar samples, we strive to take in every mini batch only those clicks which are mutually distant. For example, here we form two mini batches, four clicks connected with red and these three connected with blue lines. Samples with unreliable similarity then end up in different batches. Clicks provide cell supervision information for training CNN. After a round of training, we throw away the last fully connected layer and extract new features. Now we can update features to rebuild clicks and repeat the training. However, a large number of samples cannot be assigned to any group, because we are not confident that they are similar or dissimilar to other samples. As I said before, this happens because our initial features are weak. This deprives the optimization of using all available data during training. And after we learned new image representation, some of them can already be included as the features get more reliable. And we can repeat training. Ok, let's talk how to nevertheless exploit the information contained in such samples. Here the unassigned samples are visualized as grey dots. Blue, green and yellow dots were grouped into clicks. Since we are not 100% sure to which one click we should assign this sample, we can soft assign it to several closest clicks, for example to the blue and green clicks here. Then we can use contrastive franking laws to pull this sample closer to them and further from all other clicks. This way we enforce a partial order of the unassigned samples relative to clicks, further improving the learned features. Now let's get to results. We have trained ClickCNN on Olympic sports dataset with around 100,000 images. To evaluate how good the learned features, we take one video sequence of long jump and compute a similarity matrix between all pairs of frames. The more reddish the color, the more similar the pair of frames. We can clearly see the diagonal structures corresponding to repetitions of the gate cycle within the running phase of long jump. At the end of the sequence we have a segment of the person in the air and landing, where the body poses do not repeat. Now let's compare the click CNN similarity matrix with matrices learned by other baseline methods. The first is matrix which is built on histogram of oriented gradients that was used to form initial clicks. This similarity matrix with very low number of similar pairs supports our claim that only few highly confident relationships between images can be obtained using these features. One sample CNN is our baseline where every single sample is a surrogate class. In this case, the within class variance of an individual exemplar cannot be modeled. The ratio of one exemplar and many negatives is highly imbalanced and the learning is biased towards negative examples. Nearest neighbor CNN is another baseline, where surrogate classes are formed by grouping an exemplar and its nearest neighbors with image augmentations. It becomes evident that the proposed click CNN approach captures more detailed similarities between images. You can see it from the diagonal structures corresponding to pose repetitions. Also, click CNN produces much cleaner similarities between the frames in the landing phase of long jump. We quantitatively evaluated image retrieval on Olympic Sports dataset and the results demonstrate that click CNN outperforms all competitors by a significant margin. If we have video sequences, we can also exploit temporal information by pulling features of the frames that are close in time. Such pulling improves Rokaook score by 1%. This is an example of a training batch of clicks for long jump category. Each click contains at least 20 samples and we visualize them by averaging their members. We can see different running poses and then jumping and landing. Here is another experiment. We use the learned representation to find and order body postures extracted from other videos to fill gaps between frames of a query sequence. We selected every 8th frame for the source long jump video sequence as queries. And then we linearly interpolated between the queries and retrieved the images along the line segments, constraining the retrievals not to include frames from the same sequence that is being reconstructed. Our approach has learned similarities in pose and achieved invariance with respect to changes in appearance of the foreground objects such as skin color, clothing and so on. We observe that the feature successfully encode the temporal coherence by ordering frames from other sequences that fit in the gap. This is even more interesting, since during training absolutely no temporal structure was introduced in the model as we trained on individual frames. Alright, here we can see the nearest neighbors retrieved using clicks and features for different queries on two different datasets, Olympic Sports on the left and Leeds Sports on the right. They look pretty good, taking into account that no body pose or joint annotations were used during training. Next we did another type of evaluation. Zero-shot pose estimation. For every test image, 
we retrieved the nearest image in the training set and used it to transfer the joint annotations from it to the query test image. Click CNN was not trained to predict body joints, and we retrieved the nearest training images just based on the visual similarity. The bottom example is our failure case. Witness that our method learns representation invariant to front-back flips. It matches a person facing away from the camera to one facing the camera. Since ClickCNN learns pose similarity in an unsupervised manner, it becomes invariant to changes in appearance as long as the shape is similar, thus explaining this confusion. Adding more training data or directly incorporating face detection based features could resolve this. It turned out that ClickCNN trained on Olympic sports in an unsupervised way serves as a better initialization for supervised joint regression models such as deep poles, for example. We obtain a 2.2% improvement over ImageNet pre-training in this case. Obviously, deep poles is not state of the art anymore, but you get the idea. And finally, in addition to the experiments on pose estimation datasets, we applied the ClickCNN approach to the images of different objects from Pascal VOC dataset. Since Hawk features are not very useful for this type of dataset, we utilized features from another self-supervised method of Vank and Gupta, which used object tracking on the video as a supervisory signal. Note that the Vank and Gupta's approach cannot be trained on Pascal dataset as it requires videos. In contrast, our approach does not have such limitations. We can see how our approach improves upon the features produced by approach of Vank and Gupta to yield a performance gain of 3% without requiring any supervision. Alright, in this final part of the video I will give a brief overview over some other important self-supervised learning methods. I will post the links to all the following papers and several nice blog posts in the video description in case you would like to learn more. As I have already mentioned, Wang and Gupta tracked moving objects in the videos using surf descriptors and then forced different views of the same object to be closer in the learned feature space than random image pairs. Exemplar CNN is similar to one of our baselines, one sample CNN. Authors grouped every training sample with its random augmentations and assigned a unique surrogate label to such groups. Then neural network learned to classify surrogate classes. Dorsch et al. proposed to use spatial context as supervision. Authors cut a grid of patches from an image, and then, given a central patch of an image, network was tasked to predict if the second patch comes from the same image, and if yes, what is its location on the grid. In order to tell relative positions between patches, a model needs to understand the spatial context of objects. Narozi and Favaro had similar idea, but instead of guessing relative position of two patches, they proposed to directly train a model to predict the correct location of all nine patches after shuffling. Zhang et al. proposed to use image colorization as a pretext task. An image is converted to grayscale and then network needs to predict the original RGB value for every pixel. The idea is that the model needs to understand what object is on the image to correctly colorize it. Bratoli et al. used temporal order of the frames in the video sequence as a supervisory signal. The LSTM network is trained to distinguish between real and randomly permuted sequences. Such a task makes the network to disregard background and focus on subtle content details which change between frames. Another simple and yet very powerful approach was proposed by Guidaris et al. Rotnet is a network which learns to predict the object rotation angle 0, 90, 180 or 270 degrees. Surprisingly, such a simple task makes the network learn very expressive features. Deep Cluster by Caron et al. is an approach largely sharing the same idea as ClickCNN, but instead of building compact clicks, Deep Cluster overclusters the dataset. It means that the dataset is partitioned in the number of clusters, which is an order of magnitude larger than the number of ground truth classes contained in this dataset. For example, on ImageNet dataset which has 1000 classes, deep cluster runs k-means with 10,000 clusters. While such approach works well on ImageNet, it may fail on more fine-grained dataset like Olympic sports, where clustering would result in many unrelated human poses in the same cluster, which will hinder learning of accurate pose representation later. Recently, another type of self-supervised learning approaches gained popularity – contrastive learning. The core idea is the following. We randomly augment every image in the mini-batch, and then we use some ranking clause 
to make the representations of the augmented views of the same image close in the representation space while making the representations of two different images far apart. And here are three prominent instances of contrastive self-supervised learning. SimCLR is exactly what I have just described. Mocha v2 uses an extra module called Memory Bank to cache representations of images from the past mini batches, which increases the number of negatives used for every iteration. Large number of negatives usually has a positive effect on model performance. Biol, in contrast, does not explicitly use negative pairs in the loss but does learn negative relationships implicitly through batch normalization layers and very large batch sizes. Batch norm does contrast the activations of different images by calculating the common mode between them and removing it from all the samples in the mini batch, followed by the rescaling operation. This way the model avoids the trivial solution and does not predict the same output for arbitrary inputs, which would amount to zero loss in that case. This is all for today, thanks for listening, please write a couple of nice words in the comments if you like this episode and like the video. See you next time.